Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Where we turn our attention next to a story that defies a lot of presumptions about British politics. People on the left of British politics traditionally like to see them as defenders, champions, if you will, of the oppressed. They are usually perceived as being the most uh, uh, impassioned enemies of racism and, and bigotry, rightly or wrongly. This is just a, a general overview. Uh, right wing, often wrongly, is, is more commonly allied with, with prejudice and sententiousness. Um, certainly in the country at the moment, there's a left and right divide on issues like immigration that seems fairly clear. So why, when it comes to anti-Semitism, is the left in the dock? Early answer, I think, includes the possibility that people on the left don't perceive the residents, the Jewish residents in particular of Israel, as being oppressed in any way. So that, that would be part of the answer to the problem. Um, but it's certainly not that simple. Naz Shah, the MP who has been suspended from the Labour Party, uh, made a succession of posts on Facebook that I do believe personally were racist. Um, but I would struggle to pin down at precisely what point the needle moving from criticism of a sovereign government's actions becomes racism. And I, and I, I honestly don't know. And I know that a lot of other people who think they know don't know either. Because probably the single most surprising experience I've had since I started this job over 10 years ago is being called anti-Semitic. Of, of, of all the things I've been surprised by, and of all the insults, I get called Islamophobic every day as well, but it, of all the insults that have been thrown at me, I think the one I found most shocking was that. Because I, I can remember when it happened. And it, it happened during a, a conversation about uh, an Israeli uh, military assault upon, I can't even remember whether it was Gaza or, or it may have been long enough ago that it was... No, nope, can't remember. But the point was this. All I did was say, there must be two sides to this argument. There must be two sides to this argument, and the military capability on one side is much greater than it is on the other. So I think, naturally, one's compassion is perhaps drawn to the more poorly equipped side of the, of the battle. Uh, certainly when you see a, an army, a massed army, uh, effectively marching on, uh, what, terrorists? guerrilla warfare, but loads of civilians ending up dead as a result, that, that's problematical. And those simple observations, simply saying, actually, I think both sides probably have a point, saw my inbox absolutely, I mean, bombarded. Some of whom obviously hadn't listened to the show, but had been uh, corralled to, to, to come in really strongly. And I, I, this was before I'd grown my rhinoceros hide, and I was really hurt. As you know, I, I'm essentially a, a, a liberal bloke, and the idea that somehow you perceived me as being anti-Semitic was staggering. Unfortunately, as the years go by, the barb loses its bite. When you see it routinely thrown at people who are anything but racist, who are actually the opposite of racist, but for the simple crime of criticising the Likud party, or Benjamin Netanyahu, or the Israeli government, to call everybody who does that anti-Semitic means that everybody's confused now about what the the phrase actually means. For me, Naz Shah crossed that line in incontrovertible fashion in 2014 when she took to Facebook to call for the transportation of people from one side of the world to the other and those people would be defined effectively by their religion. 20% of Israelis, another statistic that often gets overlooked, 20% of Israeli residents aren't Jewish, they're actually Arabs and the Prime Minister of Israel can take to social media on the morning of an election and say the Arabs are voting. Come on guys and obviously he gets censured for that and he apologises afterwards but it doesn't excite the same sort of reaction in some corners of the British media that Naz Shah's comments about Jewish people have excited here so I'm confused and I don't like having these conversations because I will now get in equal measure called Islamophobic and anti-Semitic for simply wondering whether both sides in any conflict probably have a point worth listening to before resolution is ever going to be achieved. But we're talking about the British Labour Party and the problem they've got. And Rabbi Laura Jana Klauser is a senior rabbi in Reform Judaism. She, she joins me on the line now. I won't lie to you, Laura. I, I heard you being interviewed elsewhere this morning, and um, you, you, you met Naz Shah quite recently. That's right. She came to our house for an interfaith Seder last week, also with a Conservative MP. Which doesn't sound at first glance like the behaviour of a, of a stone-cold anti-Semite. She entered the... I want to say, I completely condemn 
what she did, which was wrong, 100% wrong, which she has too. When she entered my house, she looked around and she said, this is the first time that I've been in a Jewish household. I am so happy to be here. So how do you think she's got herself into this sort of mess then? I think it's not about her. I think it's about the pervasive culture in quite a lot of separate communities. We learned this 10 years ago from the report on the riot, on the riots in Britain, which mm. talked about separate living. There is a narrative, a discourse of being able to talk about Israel and Jews as completely the same thing, which we're not, of being able to talk about the other in a, in a cruel, demonizing way. So this, Naz has brought up this issue as has Ken Livingston just now, in a much worse way, in my opinion. What, what's Ken done now? What, what, what's Ken done now, Rabbi? Oh, I've been on air just, since 10. Yes, well, he's just... Um, I've got the statement here. Um, he has said... Uh, uh, he, he said he's never heard anybody saying anti-Semitic things. And um, there's a well-orchestrated campaign to smear everybody and that, to attack him for being anti-Semitic. Here's a man who has used terrible words about Jews and won't admit he's wrong. Here's a woman who lived in a very separate space, absorbed the putrid toxicity of that space, who's turned around and said, I was wrong. And she didn't just say I was wrong. She said I was wrong. And she detailed what she did. Now, NAS and the politics of the Labour Party is one thing. I'm much more interested in conversations in Britain, like the ones that you have. Yes. Conversations where we bring difficult issues, Israel, Palestine, religious extremism and violence. Those are the conversations we need to have. So someone does something very wrong. They hold up their hands. The Labour Party suspended her, which I think is an appropriate action. She turned around and said, I was wrong. So let's learn that about Naz. But I'm much more interested about what happens in her constituency. Well, we, can do, we, we, we can do both. I just, I just briefly want to, to, to pick up on a couple of the threads you've already examine because the chances are that she is going to be used now as a, as an emblem of Jeremy Corbyn's attempt to address the issue of anti-Semitism and yet a, a deeply unpleasant comment notwithstanding. I sense from you that you might feel that that would be a, a, a tad unfair. That, that, I tell you what, the word scapegoating is springing to mind. Well, it's, it, I think that it's too easy to be distracted by an interesting, charismatic politician who said anti-Semitic, anti-Israel and anti-Zionist things, who is now saying, I was wrong. Help me. Yes. Let me learn. Educate me. And That's it was a textbook example. apology. Very rare for a politician to, to, to make such an un... A uh, stinting apology in the house. The difference between the textbook and what she did is, I believe, her heart was in it. So let's, you know, I think she modelled how people who say just as bad things, and she certainly did, can turn around and say, I didn't realise. I am sorry. Please help me understand. When she was at us for this interfaith Seder with Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Christians, she asked a lot of questions. That's the way forward for British people. What does it mean when you do this? Why do you do that? Let's ask each other. How come you believe that? I don't like it when you believe that. What about this? Those are the questions we have to ask and be held accountable for. Indeed. And, and in many ways, it's, it's the age-old message of trying to focus on the things we have in common rather than the things that, 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 that separate us, uh, the commonality. And, and well, I'm not sure. That's not my message. No, no, that's not my message. My message is let's look at the things we don't have in common and let's talk about them. Because if we don't, they simmer in the background and become contaminated. So we don't have in common attitudes throughout the country to gay people. We don't have in common attitudes to Muslims or Jews. No, let's true. talk about it. It's true easy to do what we call, which is not very nice, tea and samosas. <laughs> Sit around talking about the things that we have in common, rather than saying, actually, I have no idea why you do that, and for me, you are wrong. So I don't want to do the stuff we have in common. It's too easy. Let's talk about what we don't have in common. What drives me potty about what you say, I, I, and I, I, it out. I, I was thinking, when I talked about commonality, I was thinking more about a desire to achieve concord and peace, rather than necessarily attitudes to homosexuality, or, or or indeed people of different religions, the, the desire to get along with differences rather than uh, pretending that we exist in a world where there aren't any. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at what, what, what Ken has said, and he talks about a lobby, an Israel lobby, orchestrating a campaign to smear its critics as anti-Semites. And although yes. in, in, in characteristically clumsy fashion, there, there, there's a kernel in what he says that merits further examination. W what is your view on when criticism of Israel or Likud or, or, or the elected government of that country 
is acceptable and the point at which it becomes anti-Semitic? Because I, I have to tell you, I, I don't normally struggle with distinctions like this, but on this one, okay. one feels a little battered into submission over the years. Okay, please don't get battered into submission because we need your voice. Um, Thank you. If someone criticises a legitimate state with a legitimate government who they don't agree with, uh, that is great. Let's talk about Likud policies. Let's talk about them and bring them on. Absolutely, just like we talk about Tory policy and Labour policy and so on. But what happens is the language very quickly goes from Jews, Israelis think, to Jews think, or yes. rather than Israeli policy, Israel. So the best example, in fact the worst example, is in Bradford, the previous Lord Mayor said, our education in Britain, is our history is just about Anne Frank and six million Zionists who were killed. <laughs> so, you know, that's an extreme reaction. But people often confuse, because it is confusing, Jews and Israelis. And just like you said before, 20% of Israelis are Palestinian Arab citizens within Israel. But if you, you would never use the language um, that people the blurring between Jews and Israelis that's happened now. And there is a very concerted effort to delegitimize the existence of the Jewish state of Israel, which for me is my space for liberation and my space for self-determination and national self-determination, a legitimate one, just like the Palestinians have a legitimate one alongside. Well, I mean, that that is going to be a controversial observation. The, the, the notion of equal legitimacy is going to be a controversial observation to a lot of supporters of Likud, isn't it? I want to disagree. No, no, because British jury, for instance, the vast, vast majority of British jury believe in two states. The Likud's policy is two states. Which means ending the occupation and means... Well, I, 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 this, is, this is where I talk other. about being battered into submission because if I use the word occupation, I, I will get 100 emails immediately calling me anti-Semitic. Well, it is the official language. I, I know that, and you're a rabbi, so you can say it. So why do so many people think that I can't? Uh, because the, the reason to hold on to that is that we have international law in that area and we do not have an Israeli annexation, which is good. And the way that we will move forward to um, two states is not to have Israeli law there, but to have international law there because we, it is a state in limbo. I just want to say one other thing. Of I course. had a fantastic conversation last week in Israel with people from the Palestine Liberation Organization from Fatah, with whom I really disagree on lots of things. They have set up a committee for interaction with Israeli society, and they don't go out to lefties, they go out to right-wing people and to settlers mm. to engage them in dialogue specifically with people they don't agree with. Now, that's a very interesting example. So I don't want us, and I'm sure, you know, what's lovely about LBC is that you guys don't want it either, a boring place where the anger simmers underneath. Let's bring out these issues, because Naz, who was utterly wrong, that jumped off the page, didn't it? It was just awful, all those pictures. Well, it was the, for me, it was the word transportation. That, that, that just conjures up images that nobody wants to contemplate again. Yeah, well, there were a whole load of... There were, that was, there were quite a lot of them. Of course, um, relocate Israel but, um, into the United States, a solution to the Middle East contra there was a, conflict. It, there, was, there was other stuff as well. Indeed. You know, there really was. And, um, but it's not just about her. It's not just about her. It's about the communities that she works with. It's about her constituents. And, and what passes for acceptable to comment within those communities. I, I have to tell you, my phone lines have been very busy. Do you want to talk to Ken Livingstone, Rabbi Laura? Uh, gosh, am I psychologically prepared to talk to this? You're perfectly welcome not to. Um, uh, I'd actually, you know, I, if I am in dialogue with someone that I trust to have a sensible dialogue and we've met before and talked before a bit, then I would feel okay. I feel a little bit hijacked by this. I need to... No, that's absolutely uh, fine. That's why I asked you. Uh, no, of course it yeah, does. No, I, I'm, it's not that I won't talk to him and I am happy to talk to him. I just feel like, oh, my brain is in a different place. No, I quite I understand. So, I, I, What happened if I talk to him, I will be the one accusing him of anti-Semitism. Sadiq Khan has called for his immediate suspension from the party. So I think actually the conversation should be between Ken Livingston and, and Jeremy Corbyn. Or, or me. I, I'll talk to him in a minute. What, what is the phrase he's issued today that you find particularly pungent? Just so I can put it to him. Well, after one the, of the first thing he said is, 
I've never heard anyone say anything anti-Semitic, which is kind of amazing. Yes. And he hasn't heard himself. The idea of a well-orchestrated com- campaign by the Israel lobby. Now, where is the Israel lobby? Because the only lobby I know about is the one on the way to the bedroom. Yeah, but I, I've just told you that if I described the occupied territories as occupied territories, I would get a hundred emails by the travel news calling so me anti-Semitic. The official broadcasting language of uh, the occupied territories. That well, I know that, language. and you know that. But what Ken means, I presume, and we'll talk to him imminently, is is that well, I mean, there's no way these emails from people who've never even listened to the show are happening by accident or coincidence. There is some form of organisation trying to stop people using what you yourself have just described as the legal description of that territory. Okay. So when he starts talking about well-orchestrated campaign by the Israel lobby to smear anyone who commit, criticizes Israel, blah, 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 blah yes. I don't agree with him. I don't agree with him, but the words well-orchestrated in Israel lobby, they make me deeply uncomfortable. E- even though I've just hand, told you, hand on heart, you've been kind enough to, to be complimentary about my program, but hand on heart, I, I do know what he's talking about. I could show you the emails that come from people who, who, who do seem to be, if not well-orchestrated, then choreographed. Well, I think that there are political groups. If you look at the Israel-Palestine zone, you have an extremely well-organized, as they should be, yes. Palestine Solidarity Campaign. So there is a very big difference between political organization and a well-orchestrated Israel lobby, which yes. sounds to me very bad, let alone the fact that, you know, when he went out and somebody bumped him a couple of years ago, he called them a germ, who was Jewish. He called them a, you know, a concentration camp guard and then didn't own it. But what is that? You turn around and you say, oh my gosh, that was terrible language. I'm really sorry. Yuck. He didn't. Okay, well, uh, he's hung up now, so we'll try and get him back on the line and talk to him after the travel <laughs> news. <laughs> well, t- 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 no, well, it's fair enough. I mean, he's a busy man, but we'll, we'll try and we'll try and resurrect him imminently. Probably shouldn't use religious language in the context of this conversation. Rabbi Laura Jana Klauser, I have to tell you, there's a lot of love coming in for you via social media. Uh, Lane writes, Rabbi Laura is fantastic. I really like this woman. Oh, you can actually have a debate so nice. with, a, with, a, with a rabbi like this. Uh, and then, of course, the intimation is that oh. sometimes it's rather hard to have a proper debate because of the policing of language that, all right, we won't call it well orchestrated. Well, I am absolutely up for debate. <laughs> Right, well, except not right now with Ken, for reasons... Yeah. I completely no, I completely understand, I'll make that clear. I, you, you're clearly familiar with LBC, you know how live we are and how um, routinely we turn on a sixpence, which we will do now, but I'm very grateful to you. That's a perfect start to this conversation. The question then remains, in your view, because you don't have to agree with Rabbi Laura, in your view, is she right when she says that criticising the Israeli government is not anti-Semitic? Because I have plenty of frequent correspondents who think it is. They'll say to me, well, OK, why aren't you criticising Kim Jong-un? That means you must must be anti-Semitic. Or why aren't you criticising the president of Venezuela? You're criticising the leader of Israel. That means you must be anti-Semitic. And, and I mean, it, it feels daft, that, but it's such a pungent accusation that one sometimes wonders how to respond to it. We'll find out after this. It's 11.20. And, and we are going in, almost uniform praise and quite a lot of love for my first guest there, um, uh, the rabbi who spoke of it being perfectly permissible to criticise Israel um, in the roundest terms available. And she reminded us all that the correct legal description of the occupied territories is the occupied territories not the settlements or anything like that and yet she's a rabbi so presumably she's immune from the uh, more vis- uh, visceral insults but I-, I get them and i use those words and that's why people like ken livingston do talk about an organized lobby um he's also said some staggering things today involving hitler which um well, no wonder he hung up, actually. We'll try and get him back on the line, but I am on this program, as ever, more interested in talking to you and where you put the line. Where you put the line. Because I, I, I to my internal shame, I stopped talking about the Middle East for a couple of years. Partly because the problems weren't unfolding on a, as violent or as prominent a basis as they were previously. It's, it's when there is a military campaign that our attention is, is riveted upon that region. But I stopped talking about it because I, I found it so baffling and hurtful. But I went to visit Anne Frank's house in, in Amsterdam uh, a few years ago, three or four years ago, and try to unravel in my head how anybody could think that criticizing a bombing campaign in the Gaza Strip was akin to thinking that what happened to Otto Frank and his family was somehow acceptable or permissible. And you struggle with that as a, as a, as a Western liberal. When you see this label anti-Semitic being thrown at people for simply saying, maybe you didn't have to drop that bomb. Or maybe you dropped it in the wrong place. Or maybe you've got some blame in this conflict as well. Or maybe even historically you probably would be 
describable as the oppressor rather than the oppressed in that part of the world, certainly the occupied parts of the world. So where do you think, uh, with all the things I've just said, I could almost make a list of ten observations. We could work our way from the bottom to the top and you could press a buzzer when you think it had crossed from legitimate criticism of Israel, of Likud in particular perhaps, or Benjamin Netanyahu, into something that you genuinely think is intended to insult all Jews, including, of course, the Jews who actually agree with you. Which makes it even more bonkers. You understand what I mean when I say it's a subject that historically lends itself to a desire to chew one's own ears off in frustration. Maybe not today. Neil's in Edgeware. Neil, what would you like to say? Where's the line? When does, when does criticism right. of Israel become anti-Semitism? Let, let me start off by saying, James, that um, you and me speak on a regular basis. And when we speak about things like um, rental accommodation and my twins, we get on very, very well. But, but when I ring you and we speak about Israel, we, we, we fall out because we've got very, very different opinions. So I'm going to try and keep it civil with you. Um, I'm a little bit upset about uh, what the rabbi was saying. She got quite a number of her facts wrong, but I don't know if you want me to go into those. No, I don't. I want you to tell me where the line is between... I mean, it's fairly clear. Exactly where the line Good. is. Now, let's not... Well, we'll talk about the, the word occupation, but let's talk about where the line is. In my opinion, and I regularly criticise the government of Israel, and I am a right-wing Zionist Jew. Well, I'm not religious, but I'm a right... But I criticise them because I, I believe that they're not doing this or they're not doing that or they're giving too much land. So, I, so you are not an anti-Semite, James, if you criticise the Israeli government, because then I would be an anti-Semite. However, and this is where the rub is... And Hang I, on, no. I mean, you, 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 unless I've misunderstood you, you your, your criticism might involve saying that they're not robust enough in their treatment of... of my criticism would be Netanyahu is, is an absolute traitor because he's arrested that soldier for shooting dead that terrorist, for example. That so he's not right-wing enough for you? Correct. Yeah, I, d I don't think anybody really labours under the illusion that that could be construed as anti-Semitism. Right, right-wing or left-wing, but, but if I'm... Okay, well, you but, use uh, the phrase, Neil. No wonder we don't get wing? on. <laughs> you, you, you always sound this muddled. I'm going, you, I'm going to tell you where you draw the line. And yes, sort of if you would. Before the news with the, with the North Korea thing. Right. If you criticise Israel, the only Jewish state in the world, more than all of the other ill places, for example, um, if you have campaigns to boycott Israeli goods, if you stand outside universities just criticising Israel all the time, if you are in the Palestine solidarity campaign, if you are, then, then in my opinion, but you do not go and stand outside the North Korean embassy, the Saudi embassy, the Syrian, the Turkish, the Chinese, and boycott their Chinese restaurants and boycott Turkish. You know, um, if you do not call Northern Cyprus the occupied uh, country of Northern uh, Turkey, you know, then, then in my but, but how, how do you know you when, pick on Israel? Well, when, when you're, you're listening to someone criticise Israel, how, how do you know where they stand on all those other issues? Because because I, I get involved in demonstrations, counter demonstrations for, for Israel, and I go to Mark and Spence and I go to these. So you care more about Israel than you do about all those those other countries. Well, hold on, I'm just talking about the other countries. I talk to them about their... their it's a simple question. You care a lot more about Israel than you do about all the other countries you've just mentioned. Well, not necessarily. I'm a big campaigner for, for the Cypriot um, uh, cause. Okay, so when were you last campaigning against the North Korean government? When were you last calling for a boycott of China? Because if you're allowed to care more about Israel, why, why can't Israel's critic? Yeah, hold on. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not calling for boycotts of anything, um, James. What I'm saying to you is, when I speak to these people at these demonstrations, and I say to them, why are you not outside? They say, well, we don't care about them. Yeah, but why aren't you outside? The, why aren't you outside the other embassies? I don't, I don't understand the, re the relevance. I know you don't, and that, that's kind of the point that you weren't intending to make when you Why rang in. You're allowed to care more about this issue, but your crit the critics because of this issue I'm aren't. Because I'm a Jew with family in Israel who live right. there. Right. So well, if I was a Turk, then I would probably care more about the Turkish and, and, and you turn on your radio in Britain and hear people like you, the Turkish equivalent of you, or the Chinese equivalent of you, or the North Korean equivalent of you, putting forward the different narrative just as regularly as you do the, the Israeli narrative, or, or not? Well, Because <laughs> well, you're looking for a false equality. I understand why you no, are. No, I'm not, James. Well, you are. I mean, I, I, if, if John Smith... Hold on a minute. Look, if, if, if Abd al Tar, a Palestinian, wants to campaign against Israel all day long, fair enough, I've got no problem with him supporting his boys. Yes. If, John Smith boys. from Lewisham wants to wear a uh, PLO green, red and black scarf around his neck and, and boycott every Israeli good in the world. He's never been there, but he, he couldn't give a well, damn. This is the point. This is the and point. It's brilliant. So you, you think you should be allowed to choose what you care most about and what he cares most about? Well, no, but he only no, cares... But yes, Neil. It's you're Jewish telling John Smith in Lewisham what he should care most about in the world. But no, you're allowed to choose what you care most about because, in your own words, I, I'm a Jew and I've got family I, in Israel. I, 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 
because I have a connection to Israel. What is John Smith in Lewisham's connection to Israel? Well, maybe he cares about justice, or he nature. perceives it as a humanitarian issue. Maybe he wants to live in a world where your religion doesn't define your level of interest in an issue. So, like, I just want you to be... I want to be completely clear. You think yeah. you should have the right to tell John Smith in Lewisham what he's allowed to care most about. I, I think I should have the right to accuse him of being an anti-Semite if he picks on the Jewish state above all Okay, up. so if he doesn't... If he doesn't pretend to care about the things that you care about, or he doesn't pretend to care equally about random issues that you've selected, you get to call him anti-Semitic. Correct. Yeah, that's fine. At least you're honest, mate. I don't know. No idea why we get we have problems. You're completely honest. You, you want to choose what everybody else is allowed to care about while refusing to give up any right whatsoever to deciding what you are or are not allowed to care about. And that is, for me, why it's so hard to work out where the line is. Because any criticism of Israel in your world, Neil, just to be clear, is anti-Semitic, unless I can back it up with equal criticism of, just off, off the top of your head, how many other countries would I have to criticise? Six or seven before I was allowed to criticise Israel? Or, or 18? 12? Two? Neil? Seven? <laughs> four? <laughs> three? No, it's... 29? You're, you're not understanding my point. I'm understanding it perfectly, Neil. So, from one call to another call, in uh, Lane's words, we move from common sense to nonsense in one fell swoop. It's perhaps a little unfair to describe Neil's position as nonsense. He feels that criticism of Israel is legitimate, as long as you're criticising it for not being harsher on Palestinian people, or if you want to criticise it, that's fine, as long as you offer equal criticism to an unspecified number of other countries. So, for example, that leads us to the natural conclusion that you can only, I think, is, is Japan the only Shintoist state in the world? One of my correspondents tells me, so if you criticise the Japanese for their anti-whaling policies, you must therefore be anti-Shintoist. I, I, I think that's the position. As is often the case when we find our discuss discussing these issues, the, uh, the, the spectre of Ken Livingstone is never learned looking far from the surface, and he finds himself in what I'll describe as hot water again, but, Ken, you presumably would describe it differently. What, what, what have you done now? Well, I mean, I didn't interview on LBC, I mean, and just repeated a little historical fact that when Hitler won the election in 1932 in Germany, he didn't win a majority, he was the largest party. One of his policies was to send all Germany's Jews to Israel. I, and... <laughs> I mean, people seem to have been really shocked to discover this. I mean, we don't do history anymore, do we? Well, Ken, okay, you know that the motivation for that policy was stone-cold anti-Semitism, so... Oh, yes, it was. Absolutely. So, so, so to, it cite was it in, to cite it in defence of Nath Shah is a little strange. No, I do, I'm just being asked questions, I answer them. Nath Shah is not anti-Semitic. She's a deep critic of Israel. She went right over the top in what she said. She's apologised for that. And I'm sure when... The NEC investigation is completed. It will report that no, she isn't anti-Semitic. She was just, you know, rude. But then, who am I to complain about other people being rude? Well, I, I suppose that's a fair comment. Um, you also said that you've never heard anybody say anything anti-Semitic. Well, I mean, that's oh no, no, in no, the Labour movement. Yes, in the Labour Party. Yes, yeah, in the Labour Party. Yeah. Yeah. No, no one ever. What? I mean, basically, if you're a bigot, you're not going to join the Labour Party. It's all filled with people like me, you know, advocating anti-racism and feminism. <laughs> Why then is, where do you think this perception comes from, that this, this blanket opposition to bigotry that you describe, and, and which you, I think, reasonably claim to champion in most areas, racism, yeah. wh wh why does it become so confused when we turn to the issue of, of Israel in particular and, and Jewishness? Well, I think there's a real problem that, I mean, if I say to you now that I think the South African government is riddled with corruption, you're not going to say I'm saying that because I'm a racist. And I think we've got to separate, people who are anti-Semitic hate Jews. And not just the Jews in Israel, they hate their Jewish neighbour in Golders Green or Stoke Newington. Um, and that's a completely different situation when people are critical of the Israeli government. You put it like that, it's, you put it like that, it's, it, it's straightforward. So wh where does all this complication come from? I, I think that just, we've had for years and years, anyone who criticises the government of Israel is just denounced as anti-Semitic. My worry about that is that it sort of undermines the importance of attacking real anti-Semitism because people are going to think, no, it's all just about, you know, people criticising Israel. Where there's, there are real problems of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic attacks, anti-Semitic 
and and you know, and it's probably fair to observe yes that that sort of anti-Semitism is probably more prevalent in uh, or, or, or with a background like Nas Shah's, you are more likely to encounter that sort of anti-Semitism, real anti-Semitism, than you are in the in the in the saloons of Westminster or the or the you know the the, the talking shops of the Labour Party. Oh, yeah, you went, you know, and literally, I'm not lying. I mean, I've never heard anyone in the Labour Party say something anti Semitic, endless criticism of the government of Israel. You must, you must have heard them say that the Jews run the world or the Jews. I mean, I get emails like that alleging that this company is part of oh, a yeah. Jewish conspiracy. You must have heard stuff like that. I've heard that, but not from anyone in the Labour Party. You hear that from people who are. You hear that from people. You hear that. The people. Oh, I've got a violent MP threatening me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Well, hang on a minute. Bye -bye. C -c carry Bye -bye. on, Ken. Are you all right, Ken? Well, you, I, I'm going to stay with this just to make sure Ken's all right, if that's all right with you guys. Ken, still there. I, I'm still here. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah. There's some, some MPs a bit over the top. What, in their criticism of you? Ken Levinson here under some yeah, sort of. Problem here, another one of these Labour MPs who came over the top. Who, who, who is it? To you, I'm afraid. Who, who are you with? Ken Livingston under some sort of verbal, some form of verbal attack from people he's just described as other Labour MPs. I'm afraid my journalistic instincts aren't going to let me hang up the phone. I think I think we may have lost that choice. Well, there you go. So uh, it sounded as if he was coming under fire. Sadiq Khan has called for a suspension. The words are pretty powerful. He, he issued them on LBC about uh, Hitler's original policy in 1936. No denial from him that that original policy was... Uh, deeply anti-Semitic, therefore perhaps a, um, a, a that, that's, you know, Britain in 2016, a man standing in the street in his 70s apparently being verbally attacked by Labour members of Parliament. So keen are they to prove their e equality, e equality credentials. Strange times we're living in. 11.42 is the time, and the question you need to answer now is, is where the line is. Because I, I could probably say... <sighs> that I feel there is a concerted attempt to stifle any criticism of Israel, and it's a really good and successful attempt, because you call someone anti-Semitic, and they will think of gas chambers and holocausts. They won't think of, oh, it's, a, it's an academic exchange about the foreign policy of a sovereign government. That use of that word is designed to cow people into silence. The problem is that it works whether it's accurately applied or not. So when is it accurately applied, and when is it not accurate, accurately applied? We had a rabbi telling us it's perfectly permissible to criticise the foreign policy of Israel, and then we had a, a self-described Zionist Jew describing himself, or, or, or describing any criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic, unless you can somehow back it up with proof that you've criticised lots of other governments as well, which seems odd, because he's allowed to choose what he cares most about, but critics of that country, in, in his worldview, are not. And, and that's, that's the opposite of... To democratic liberalism. Mark's in Barnet to, to clear the air. Mark, I hope you don't get attacked while you're talking to me. What would you like to say? I would hope not. My mother-in-law... <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Oh, God. You know, so I listen to you all the time, James. Good man. Sometimes I'm listening, I'm almost screaming at the radio. Almost? Almost? No, actually, he's Th literally screaming. Thank you. And sometimes I think it's the best show on radio. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Uh, I think it's probably in the latter, quality, in the latter category. Thank you. Um, uh, this subject is, is riddled with complications, obviously. Isn't it? Uh, what I wanted to do, look, I'm a Jew living in North London. Can I just kind of, what it feels like to be Jewish yes. at the moment, it, it feels different to how it's felt for quite some time, I think. But on the other hand, at least these issues are being aired most notably through this program actually mm. but it feels different and the narrative feels that it seems to be different look of course criticizing the government of israel is not anti-semitic jews do it here in america and in israel for heaven's sake so of course it's not anti-semitic to criticize the government of israel but i think i've studied a lot of history and what i do know is that anti-semitism in in a way differs to other forms of prejudice in the way that it morphs. Yes. It morphs 
different, you know, you, you presumably, I'm, I'm sure you know all this, you know, there were the protocols of the elders of Zion, which is all about the Jewish blood ritual and all the rest of it. And then it morphed into something about Jews being in charge of cap, the world capitalism. And then it went under Hitler. It was all about what well, Jews were in charge of the Bolsheviks. It morphed into different things. It can be a... a but I, I have no trouble in identifying that as anti-Semitism. I find your employment of the word morphs perfect because I, I'm interested in, in where that morphing begins and where, where the accusation becomes accurate rather than really horribly unfair. No, but the point I'm trying to make is that I think the morphing, we're, we're, see, we're living through it now, the morphing is, is, is now about Israel. And there's a narrative that seems to have built up amongst left, the, the extreme left, I should say, not the left in general, where the narrative has gone from criticizing the government of Israel, as your rabbi was saying, to a delegitimization of the state. And, that, and as a Jew, look, the thing is, Jews really care about Israel. Now, you might think, well, why should you care about Israel more than you do, as you were saying to the bloke? No, no, I don't. No, I don't. I categorically don't think that. I completely understand that. I have a deep understanding of that, because I've, I've, I've read so deeply. And of course, every Jewish person in the shadow of the Holocaust has a relationship with Israel that is emotional, intellectual, if not geographical, that, that cuts to the core of their very being. I completely understand that. But you're not allowed to tell me what I'm allowed to care about. No, I don't. Of course I don't. I don't and the last caller did. Neil did. Oh, well, that's, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not speaking on this. You know, no, I know you're not. I'm just reminding you that, that that mindset is quite common. Yes, it probably is. There is a mindset that says, well, I've, I've come across people I know and respect and love who've kind of said, well, what does this person think about Israel? Yes. At the expense of all else. And you think, well, hang on, this person, in a public figure sort of thing, I once heard somebody say about when Nelson Mandela died, Oh, it was a terrible thing. When, you know, listen, yes. he was a, a wonderful man. And I remember some. I heard somebody say, "What did he think about Israel?" And I thought to myself, <laughs> "What is that?" <laughs> <laughs> I was an unbelievable world character. What the hell does it matter what he thought about Israel? You know. And so there is this kind of sub, sub uh, submission of everything else to what people think about Israel. However, on the other side. We really, really care about Israel. Yes. And it, you just took the words out of my mouth. In the shadow of what's happened in the, in the last mm, century... Mm, utterly yeah. beyond uh, any, any quibbling. I mean, it is it, it's of profound importance. But I say that as a, as a human who, who, who doesn't actually... I don't see the Holocaust as an exclusively Jewish persecution because it wasn't. I see that as an example of what humans can do to humans if certain lies are allowed to be spread and certain tactics are allowed to be employed. Uh, uh, and, of course, as a Jew, you will see the Holocaust course is different it will be specifically not the thing that killed members of your family it's not well thankfully not members of my family but and not specifically not specifically jewish but in the main it was a jewish but in the context of a conversation about israel we have to be thinking about jewish victims of the holocaust not not the roma or the or the homosexuals or the trades unionists or, or the left wingers <laughs> So I think the thing I would, I would want to say is that when there seems to be a narrative around the legitimization of of a Jewish state, that feels it, it feels threatening. That's the point. Yeah. I couldn't put it any more than that. It feels threatening to Jewish people. You know, I get that, and and and, and maybe it's not anti-Semitic, but it's as near as damn it when you're effectively calling for the abolition of a sovereign state. But when Jewish people or when self-described Zionists tell me that there's no such thing as Palestine or there's no such or they oppose a two-state solution and you, you know I could open the phone I know I found someone who thinks that Israel should expand from I, I always forget what the figure of speech is but greater Israel should be established and inviolate with a massive great big wall around it that that's equally offensive to me does that make me anti-semitic no are you still talking to me yeah. <laughs> no of course it doesn't of course it doesn't well, you know how do you deal with the people who say that it does what do you say to them what, who, 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 so it's anti-Semitic to, to offer up any criticism of Israel, to offer up any claim that the that, that Arab people in that region have the right to a homeland as well. What do I say to them? Yeah. Well, I, we try and d discuss the issues with them as, as they are evident to me. But um, it, it, when people take that view, which is a, a, you know, a, a very binary view of that type, yes. 
Sometimes, it, and on the other side, frankly, it happens on the other side. Of course, it does. You, you, it's, very, it's very difficult to have a rational conversation with people who take take that kind of view. You know, it's about you mentioned before to the rabbi. Well, one area where I did disagree with her mm. is where you said it's about trying to find common ground, and that surely has to be where it is. <laughs> you know, but but there's too many people are either on. Not the Israeli right. I wouldn't call it that. But what you know, would you call it? Side, what, what, what would you call it? You know what really disturbs me. Sorry, I'm going. Up, I'm not answering your question. That's but fine. I'm, I'm enjoying listening to you. That's the only rule you have to obey. <laughs> what really disturbs me is when I hear people, um, and, and that Shah didn't say this. To be fair, no. But when I hear people use the word Zionist in a content, in a very pejorative way. And so, you know, Zionism just means that they feel that the Jews have the right to a, to a, a, a national home. Which makes me a Zionist. I'm a Zionist. So I know what you mean. But that's why I asked you what phrase would you, you would use, because I knew you were implicitly rejecting the use of the word Zionist for the reason you've just explained. Then you rejected the Israeli right as well. So what is one left with, Mark? In, to, to, to describe what? The constituency you're talking about. The, 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 the people who believe in a greater Israel, the people who, who don't believe in any sort of Palestinian... You could call religious fundamentalists in one sentence. Yeah. You could, there are religious fundamentalists, some of them go to my synagogue, who, would, who probably would believe that. And yet if you uh, well, told them you thought they were radicalised, that would be pretty much the basest insult you could throw at them. A language that's used within the Jewish community. Yeah. And nor is religious fundamentalism, but you could argue that there are religious, there's, there's a group in Israel called the Haredi. They're the sort of people, you wouldn't call them, well they are probably in the, on, the, on the religious right in Israel, and the problem that Israel has, and we're having this conversation over our Seder meal a few, uh, <laughs> last week, <laughs> is that actually they are an obstacle to peace. And you could, and Netanyahu, it has to bow down because of the way this Israeli politics is is structured. And the, oh, the, the, these are the guys who don't want to sit next to women on planes and things like that. The sort of people that don't like when you had a phone in a while ago about people who don't want their women to drive the wife their mothers to drive their kids to school. Yes, you know it's that kind of right. But you can't have a sensible conversation with those guys any more than you can have a sensible conversation with a bloke who's anti-Israel, anti anti-Semitic, and anti. So, so why, why can't people like you dominate this conversation instead of the others? Because I've got to tell you, Mark, you won't be surprised to learn this. I've got a job to do. I so, well, luck, luckily, I've got a job to do as well. But it involves talking to wonderful people like you, Mark. Thank you. And, and I would add, just for the record, and I, I, the, the, when we had that conversation about men who believe that their women, their women, I, their phrase, not mine, shouldn't be allowed to drive cars. I got called anti-Semitic for opposing that as well, but clearly not like, not by people like Mark. I don't know what Neil and Edgeware would have thought. Maybe I'd have to find a bunch of other mis medieval misogynists and criticise them. Oh, I do. So presumably I'm allowed to criticise those ones because I criticise the other type as well. Some of you, in fact many of you, are a little concerned about the um, whereabouts and safety of my colleague Ken Livingstone, whose interview with this programme was somewhat rudely curtailed while he claimed that he was under attack from Labour MPs. I, I wondered whether there was a touch of Livingstonian hyperbole coming into play there, but then I looked at the Twitter feed of the esteemed journalist, the veritable doyen of the doorstep, Michael Crick of Channel 4 News, and uh, I made a shock discovery. Michael Crick joined is on the line now. Michael, what just happened? Well, um, about 10 minutes ago, Ken Livingston and John Mann arrived outside, separately arrived outside Four Millbank here in Westminster to do interviews with the various broadcasters here and uh, got into a blazing row which lasted about three or four minutes. Uh, started off by John Mann accusing uh, Ken Livingston of being a lying racist and a Nazi apologist. Um, and it just went on at the level uh, for about three or four minutes until uh, one or the other, I can't remember which, went into the BBC. Uh, some of this was captured on film and people's video phones. Uh, and basically, Mann was saying that Livingston should be thrown out of the, uh, thrown off the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party by the end of the day. Uh, and he was basically uh, equating Livingston to being uh, many of the people who uh, defend uh, the Nazi regime and um, uh, are anti-Semitic in, in, in the things they say. But it was I think it's the nastiest row I've seen between two politicians uh, in 36 years in journalism. Uh, and uh, certainly the nastiest row I've seen between two politicians who are officially from the same party. <laughs> you second-guessed my next point there. Um, that is the, I mean, the, the remarkable thing about this. Those, those are often the worst rows. Yeah, of course they are. are. There's no, but, no. I mean, it, just, it just illustrates the way in which in, in just 24 hours this whole thing has exploded. Um, and it's not just about uh, Israel 
or Jewish people or what happened in the 1930s, underlying all this are huge, huge differences about the whole politics of the Labour Party. Um, and it, clearly, I think there are those who are uh, critics of Corbyn and of Livingstone, who's very close to Corbyn, of course, who are using this um, as a stick with which, which to beat him. On the other hand, there are clearly people in the Labour Party, which Corbyn has been slow to do anything about, who have said things which Jewish people find very, very offensive. Although, uh, and it's very difficult to see how this row gets resolved. Well, that, that was uh, the, my next question, really, is, is whether or not you can foresee any resolution. You had a Corbyn spokesman yesterday describing a crisis of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, but then you have key lieutenants and old allies like Ken Livingstone denying that there's anything of the sort there. I, I mean, the, the only winners if you like here, are the Tories, aren't they? Indeed, and I put that point to John Mann and Ken Livingstone. You've got to remember, there's an election <laughs> a week today. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 what an extraordinary way to behave in those circumstances when you know that there are cam the cameras are on you. Um, and quite how uh, Corbyn is going to handle this Livingston situation, I do not know. I mean, Nashar is one thing, uh, who's now been suspended. You know, Livingston is one of the two or three people who are closest to uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, it Indeed. will be of Henry the Fourth proportions if, uh, <laughs> if, if if Corbyn was to decide that Livingston has to go as well. A neat reference there to the 400th anniversary. And I, I shall reward you, Michael Crick, with a neat reference to the fact that you're on air standing in for Ken Livingston on LBC at 10 o'clock on Saturday. How, how did you find your debut? Ah, it, it, a huge fun. Uh, and uh, I, I'm just looking forward to Saturday morning as well, when no doubt many of these issues will come up. They will. Uh, I'm not quite, I don't think I'll be saying quite the things that uh, Ken Livingston might be saying on air, but I hope it will be nonetheless be uh, pretty controversial stuff and a lot of good banter between me and uh, David Mellor. It will just be banter. We won't be seeing Man Livingston style uh, contretemps. Right. Okay. Right. Great. God okay. Michael Thanks Crick, so many thanks indeed.